I had an order for an inside the waistband holster and belt for a SIG P365 with the Crimson Trace laser guard and the customer asked if I could film the process and post it to YouTube. So let's get started. To create the pattern, I begin by tracing an outline of the gun onto a clean sheet of paper. I also mark the location of the safety and the ejection port. To determine the stitch line, I use a strip of leather that's the same thickness that I'll use to build the holster. Make a mark on the center of the strip and then wrap the strip around the gun and pinch it together. Mark where the leather touches. Center the narrowest measurement over the muzzle and transfer the marks. Then draw a parallel line along the top of the slide. Now I'll transfer any remaining measurements to the gun outline. I'm now sketching in the stitch line by roughly maintaining the measured distances along the bottom of the gun outline. To make sure the sights don't drag on the interior of the holster, I'm offsetting a line along the slide approximately one quarter of an inch. This will allow me to insert a dowel when I'm ready to mold the sight channel. I want to make sure there's plenty of room to grip the pistol without the top of the holster getting in the way, so I offset a line along the front of the grip roughly one inch. I'm making the top of the belt roughly intersect the stitch line and my one inch offset. Using a protractor, I draw a line at approximately 15 degrees, which is the carry angle I'll be using for this build. For the snap hardware, I need roughly one inch of clearance between the top of the belt and the top of the holster. Using a circle template, I'll start to draw in the top of the holster pattern, being sure to stay clear of the mag release and also being sure to provide plenty of coverage over the trigger guard. I lower the front of the pattern down until it touches the belt. This helps to provide more clearance on the draw stroke so the gun doesn't have to travel upward any further than necessary to clear the front of the holster. To make sure the barrel of the gun is protected, I'm offsetting a line roughly one quarter to three eighths of an inch from the bottom of the gun. Since there's no belt slot on the trailing edge of the holster, I finish the pattern by drawing smooth curves that roughly follow the stitch line, while also leaving plenty of room for stitching. If you didn't want a sweat shield, this pattern could be called done at this point. To draw the sweat shield, I begin by drawing smooth corners around the butt of the slide and then blend in the curves so it connects with the rest of the pattern. Be sure to keep the leather away from the thumb along the bottom edge of the slide to provide enough grip clearance so that you don't grab the holster when you grab the firearm. The T-nuts for the snap hardware will be embedded between the holster and the reinforcement piece. I'm drawing the reinforcement so it covers most of the trigger guard and then wraps around and covers the sweat shield. Quick tip, don't throw away your X-Acto blades when they get dull. Just sharpen them on a stone and keep using them. The sharp point on new blades loves to break off in the cutting surface and can easily damage your projects or cut you if you don't notice the break and remove it from the surface. I've used this blade for years and just give it a quick sharpen when necessary. To complete the pattern, I cut along the outline and then fold it over and trace it to the other half of the paper. Then I slowly cut away the pieces and use them to build the remaining pattern pieces. I accidentally transferred the location of the T-nuts onto the body panel but they only need to be marked on the reinforcement piece since we don't want the T-nuts making contact with the firearm. I transfer the stitch line to the sheet below and then begin to extract the reinforcement piece from the original drawing. I prefer to keep all of my marks and labels on what would be the right hand side of the pattern. Since the majority of orders are for right handed holsters, this helps to make sure I don't accidentally build the holster for the wrong hand. If I need to build a left handed holster and I see text on the pattern, at a glance I quickly know I'm using the wrong side of the pattern. And I get asked this all the time. For a left handed holster, all you have to do is flip the pattern pieces over and trace them from the other side.
This order was for a left-handed holster, so the pattern pieces are upside down. I'm building this holster out of 7 to 8 ounce Herman Oak vegetable tanned leather. The belt will be built out of two layers of the same leather I'm using for the holster. This results in a belt that's roughly one quarter of an inch thick when done. I'm dyeing the leather with Phoebing's Pro Dye and the color for the body pieces and the belt will be dark brown and the reinforcement piece on the holster will be black. I prefer to apply dye with an airbrush and I spray three to four coats of dye on all pieces. The only part I will leave natural will be the liner side of the belt. The airbrush I'm using is an old Badger 150 and it's powered by a small Senko PC1010 one gallon compressor. My airbrush cabinet has two box fans that pull the fumes away from me and exhausts it outside. I attach one end of the belt to a spring clip and then hang the belt from a nail in a board that I temporarily hang from the top of my airbrush cabinet. I apply three to four coats of dye in a circular motion. After the dye has had plenty of time to dry, I edge, burnish, and dye the bottom edge of the reinforcement piece since this has to be done before I attach it to the holster body. I'll also edge and burnish the belt loop piece as well. To dye the edges, I'm using a Montana acrylic empty marker and I filled it with Phoebing's Pro Black Dye. Ask 10 different makers how they burnish their edges and you'll get 10 different answers. I'm starting with Phoebing Saddle Soap to help shape and smooth the edge. And then I wax the edge and polish it with a Coco Bolo burnisher mounted in my drill press. Then I buff the edge with a piece of canvas or denim cloth. Now I'm transferring the location of the T-nuts and then punching appropriately sized holes through the reinforcement piece. I position the pattern over the outside of the body panel and then transfer the pattern marks for the stitch line and the reinforcement piece. Then using my scratch awl, I scuff up the surface where the reinforcement piece will be located. I'll be gluing the reinforcement to the body panel with Weldwood contact cement. I apply cement to both pieces, then give it a few minutes to dry. Install the T-nuts into the flesh side of the reinforcement piece and then hammer them into place. Carefully align the reinforcement piece with the body panel and then hammer the pieces together to form a tighter bond. 
I like to use a socket that's about the same diameter as the T-nut flange to help seat the prongs into the leather. Transfer the stitch line to both halves of the inside face of the holster. This is so we know where to apply glue, but also so we know where the openings start and stop so we can edge, dye, and burnish the appropriate areas of the holster openings. I typically inset my stitch line approximately 3 16 of an inch from the edge of the leather. To mark the stitch line, I'm using a Tandy adjustable creaser. I'm sewing the holster on the Cobra Class 4, and I'm using 277 bonded nylon thread in the top and bottom. Now I'll hammer the stitches flat and then trim away the excess thread and melt the ends with a lighter. To make it a little easier to fold the holster closed, I like to apply a little water to the interior of the holster, as well as to the reinforcement piece. Avoid getting water on the rest of the holster at this point to help minimize the chance of water stains.
I'm now ready to form the holster. I typically soak the holster for approximately 10 seconds, which is what I did in this video. If you're not using a vacuum press, I would suggest starting off with soaking the holster for one to two seconds and using a sponge to apply a little more water if necessary. Since I'm using a dummy gun to form the holster, I prefer to remove the front sight whenever possible, which makes it easier to slide a dowel into the holster to help mold the sight channel. The exposed posts on the T-nuts can damage the silicone vacuum bag, so to help minimize damage, I install leather washers over the post prior to inserting the holster into the bag. To ease friction, I apply a little silicone lubricant onto the surface of the bag. The forming tools I typically use is a bone folder, wooden burnisher, and the rounded end of a Sharpie marker. As you can see, the vacuum press doesn't do very much on its own, so I finish detail molding on my granite slab. If you'd like more detail about the molding process, I'd suggest you visit the learnleather.com website and search for a video called Holster 102 Wet Molding by Hand by Jason Engel. It's well worth the watch. The leather was a little too damp, and I was having a hard time getting the leather to hold the detail. If you have this problem, let the leather rest and dry out for a few minutes. Humidity and temperature have a big impact on drying times, and some leather takes on moisture more easily than others. There's no magic time limit for soaking your holster for forming. Just experiment and see what works for you, and know that you can quickly add more water if necessary. But taking water away takes a lot more time and patience. While the holster is drying, I'll switch gears and focus on the belt. Using my acrylic belt end template, I mark the hole locations for the buckle end of the belt. To determine the length of the belt, I temporarily install the belt buckle and then position the inside edge of the roller on the edge of my bench. Using a tape measure, I position the center hole of my belt template on the customer's desired belt length and then trim away the excess from the belt blank. The piece I cut away will be used to make the belt keeper. Now I'll remove the buckle Trim the liner layer to length, and then glue the two belt pieces together.
In case you were wondering why I dampened the belt keeper a little earlier, this is why. So I could crease the edges with my adjustable creaser. I'm using a small trimming plane to help flatten the edges of the belt. To help hold the belt still, I cut a one quarter inch groove in a scrap piece of 2x4 pine. The belt length can change a bit during the sewing process, so I like to stretch the belt out a bit by hand after sewing, and then reinstall the buckle again so I can mark the adjustment hole locations. In order to trim the belt keeper to the proper length, I trim one end of the keeper straight, then position the end on the center of the belt, then wrap the keeper around both ends of the belt and mark where the keeper overlaps itself, then trim the keeper on that point. Even though I've never had a problem with a staple failing, I've been forcing myself to tie the ends of the keeper together over the last few months. But let's face it, staples literally take about 5 seconds to install. I'm sure it would be best to skive and glue the ends of the keeper together, then sew the ends to reinforce the bond. But all of that adds several minutes, at a minimum, to each belt keeper. If you have a method you like, or if you know of a video online that demonstrates your favorite technique, I'd love if you could share it in the comments below. Because like most of us, I'm always trying to learn new and better ways to do things. I'm sealing the leather with Phoebing's Resoline Acrylic Sealer, diluted 50-50 with water. I prefer to dilute the Resoline to reduce the gloss and so that I can apply it more heavily for better penetration without resulting in a super glossy finish. I like to brush the mixture onto the flesh surface first and then apply it to the exterior grain surface.
for the belt, I start with one edge and apply several coats, then come back and polish the edge with my wooden burnisher. Then I repeat the process on the other edge. Before I apply sealer to the liner side of the belt, I need to apply my maker's mark. So I dampen the leather with a bit of water and use a brass stamp in my hydraulic press to apply the mark. You can see the press and stamp in a previous video. The snap press that I'm using is called the Press and Snap. It's made of aluminum and I have it mounted in their optional bench mount. It came with a set of Line 24 dies, though you'll need to modify the included socket die for the pull the dot snap sockets, or purchase the socket die that's specifically designed to work with the directional snap sockets. The screws I'm using to attach the belt buckle are one quarter inch Chicago screws with a star drive head on one end and a smooth dome on the other. You can add thread locker if desired, but since the screws have a smooth dome on one side, they would be next to impossible to remove if the customer ever wanted to swap out the belt buckle. I've never personally had a problem with the screws falling out, but if you really want to add thread locker, go for it. In case you're wondering about my snap hardware, I'm using 632nd quarter inch black oxide T-nuts for the snap post, and the rest of the snap hardware is from Pull the Dot. The screws are 632nd thread, half inch long stainless steel with an undercut flat head to help them recess into the snap studs a little bit better. And that's about it. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to hit the like button. And if you'd like to see future videos, please subscribe and ring the bell. For patterns and acrylic templates, drop by my website at adamsleatherworks.com. Take care and thanks for watching.